church. My grandfather was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and evangelist, um, literature evangelist actually, um, in Germany. Some of you may know the book A Thousand Shall Fall, which is my family story. My, that's my grandfather in that story, and my dad is one of the kids in the story. So anyway, um, I grew up hearing a lot about the kinds of things we're going to talk about today. And sometimes it was a little scary, and sometimes it was very exciting. But as I shared this morning, my dad always said, oh, this is such an exciting time to live. I want to be alive when Jesus comes. And that was always a, a hope that, that was dear in his heart. My dad was a pastor and a theologian as well, and um, taught here before I was born, and then moved up to Nashville to do a PhD at Vanderbilt in uh, biblical studies, and I was born while they were up there, and then he got a call to Andrews right after that to start a doctoral program in, in theology at the seminary. So I grew up at Andrews, even though I was born in Tennessee, and that's why I don't have a typical accent from this area. I tell people from the South, it took me 29 years to make it right and move back to where I belonged. So anyway, but, um, but end times are really exciting. For me, they've become very, very meaningful because of two factors, the interrelationship between the Bible, prophecy, and history. In my estimation, and as I've thought about this over the years, there are two things that make the Bible unique when compared to any other religious text of any other major world religion. So I'm talking here about the Quran. I'm talking here about the Hindu scriptures, of which there are a variety of them. If you compare these various religions, one thing you will find that makes the Bible completely and utterly unique, one, it's constituted in history, in, set in real time and real space and places where God is interacting with his people in history. You don't have that in any other of these books. Just to give you an example, in, um, in the Bible, by the time you get to Genesis 10, you already have a lot of geographical information given. If you read the entire Quran from cover to cover, the number of geographical places, the number, not the same place names obviously, but the number will already have been taken up by the time you get to Genesis 10 in the Bible. That's the difference between those two. Most of it is ideas. You know, the prophet received ideas. Uh, Muhammad wrote down these ideas that he received supposedly from Allah and, and so forth. So the Bible is unique because it's constituted in history, and that allows us to see God acting in history over time, right? We'll, we'll touch on that at the end of this presentation. The second thing that makes the Bible utterly and completely unique is that is the only book the only religious text that is a prophetic book, 30%, almost 30%, 29%, according to one encyclopedia of prophecy that I have, 29% of the Bible is prophecy. I mean, the Quran doesn't have any prophecy. Most other religions don't do that. And if you understand the difference between a mythical worldview and a transcendent worldview and the biblical worldview, we don't have time to go into that today, but it's, it's, it's very clear. So, so the Bible is unique in those two different things. Which, and, and, and by the way, history and prophecy are linked together because, um, as we'll see in this presentation, historicism is a way that we understand prophecy as, as it unfolds over time. So let's look at this a little bit more. I want to dispel, though, as we're looking at this screen, here, I want to dispel some of the fear that sometimes we have when we talk about prophecy. I don't think we need to have that. In fact, I believe God gave us prophecy in Scripture so that we wouldn't have to be afraid of what happens in the future. He wanted us to give us a roadmap already so that we would kind of know where we're heading and what we're going. I mean, can you imagine how terrified people are out there that are looking at the world around and wondering what on earth is going on and how, does all these things, how do all these things fit together? So I think that God has given us a very, very wonderful assurance. He says in John 14, this is one of my favorite passages, John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And we can continue that. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. 
He tells his disciples when he's about to leave, let not your heart be troubled. I'm telling you these things because I want you to be aware. And so I think that that's something that can help us today as well. Also in John, just a couple of chapters later, we have this wonderful verse in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Jesus wants us to have peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. In this world you will have trouble. Uh, the King James Version says tribulation. Um, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus is ultimately in control. Jesus is ultimately in charge. And because of his victory at the cross, we can have the assurance that he is, will be doing what he has promised that he will do. So in this two-part series, we're going to look at Revelation 13. That's what I was tasked to do this weekend. So I've, I've kind of been given an assignment. And we're going to touch on a few other places too. But we're going to talk about the first sea beast in the first presentation of prophecy and the deadly wound that was received. That's Revelation 13, 1 through 10. And then in our second presentation, we're going to look at the second sea beast. We've already had allusions to that this weekend with uh, Pastor Arnold's presentations. The second sea beast, sorry, the second land beast, I should say. That's his typo there. I should say land beast. The second land beast. Um, the second land beast of prophecy, of course, is the United States, right? So we have the sea beast and the land beast, and we're going to look at these two and how they interact with each other as we go into uh, things. So let's begin by reading Revelation 13, 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles, follow along. In fact, we could even read it together, perhaps. Um, but in Revelation 13, we have... Uh, that's, of course, the chapter before Revelation 14, obviously, which we've been focusing on this weekend. But in Revelation 13, 1 through 10, it says, And he stood on the sand of the seashore, that's John, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horn were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon... Who's the dragon? Satan gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And by the way, we don't have time for this today, but if you go back to Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8, the little horn has a similar description of things there, right? In, that, in those passages. Was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months. By the way, that time frame goes along with what time frame in Daniel? Yeah, the 2300 days, but within the 2300 days, the 1260 years, right? That time period there, right? So we have that. The 42 months was given to him. That's the time of the papacy. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the, Lamb, of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So that's an interesting phrase that we just ended with, right? Because that's the same phrase that is used in Revelation 14 to describe the saints of the end time and the last days. So how do we understand prophecy? I'm going to talk now a little bit about how do we understand this. Just let's talk about some basics and ways in which this has been understood over the centuries. And we're going to talk a bit today about historicism. Historicism is the method of interpretation that the Bible writers use themselves to interpret prophecy. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, and historicism is defined, this is one definition of historicism. Let's just look at this definition. In historicism, biblical prophecies are interpreted as representative of literal historical events. What kind of events? Literal events. That's very, very important. They're not spiritual events, although they have a spiritual component, 
but they're literal events that take place where? In history. In history. That's why we call it historicism, right? In history. And we, again, can study the Bible historically because it is a historically constituted book. By the way, I'm an archaeologist. Let me just share this with you. You're not going to find any institutes of Buddhist archaeology out there or Confucian archaeology or Hindu archaeology, but you're going to find institutes of biblical archaeology at places like Harvard, at places like Johns Hopkins, at places in, at seminaries around the world. Why? Because the Bible is different than all those other religions. We can actually investigate and find and excavate the places that these events took place because it is based in history and God intervenes in his history, in the history of his people. So that's the cool thing that we can, we have an institute of archaeology here at Southern, downstairs, in case you didn't know. And we're able to do that here. So history is, so historicism, the whole of Bible prophecy as a sweeping overview of church history. Think of the seven churches of Revelation 2 through 3. They are, they're representing physical churches in John's time, but they're also representing the sweep of history all the way down to Laodicea, the last church, which we believe is the church before Jesus comes, right? This approach involves interpreting symbols or figures in the Bible as metaphors for actual events, nations, or persons of history. Now, we didn't make up this stuff. Adventists didn't make up the way we interpret prophecy. This was something that we have inherited through the historicist interpretation of prophecy through the centuries. In fact, Daniel and others um, at his time uh, interpreted prophecy this way. Think of this image in Daniel chapter 2. Right? Where did it begin? Where does the image begin with the head of gold? What was the, who was the head of gold? Babylon. Where was Daniel living at the time? Babylon. So all the way through history, from the time of Daniel when he was writing this, and by the way, later chapters when he's in the Medo-Persian Empire begins in the Medo-Persian Empire, right? As he's writing this, he is looking at history in a continual uninterrupted fashion all the way to the end of time when the rock cut out without human hands comes and strikes the image at its feet, which is very important because that's the end of time and it represents the coming of Jesus Christ, right? So we have this, we have this here, you know, the head of gold, the arms and chest of silver, the thighs of brass or bronze, the legs of iron that of course continue, that iron continues, right? All the way to the end. What, why is that important? Because the, 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 well, we'll talk about that. I got knocked ahead of myself. So historicism not only sees Daniel this way, and by the way, Daniel didn't see it this way. Nebuchadnezzar saw it this way. And then Daniel interpreted what Nebuchadnezzar saw, and he says, as, as we can read there, we don't have time today, but as a continual line of history, one kingdom following directly after another. And we know historically that's exactly what happened. So studying history allows us to see how prophecy was fulfilled and allows us to see specifically through the prophecies of Daniel. And by the way, in Daniel chapter 8, Medo-Persia and Greece are, are named by name as two of those kingdoms. So we know that's the case, right? Uh, so as we go on, here, here, this is a little grainy, but anyway, it gives us the idea. Daniel 2 is expanded upon in Daniel 7, which is expanded upon in Daniel 8. More detail is given in each of these chapters as what moves through. It's, 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 it's expanded and, and made broader um, until you get to Daniel 11 and 12 when, when you even have the most detail provided. And they really, uh, each chapter kind of mirrors uh, one another. So there, there's a recognized continuity here between pagan Rome or imperial Rome and what happens down here, right? Between uh, the little horn that is first moving horizontally and then is moving vertically to challenge the Most High God, right? So that's what we have going on here. So there's, a, there's that, and we're going to talk about this. And by the way, Protestants did not make it up. They couldn't because it was in Scripture, number one. But the second thing is, they didn't because Roman Catholicism recognized this in themselves and presented themselves as, as the continuation of Rome, Imperial Rome, in history. We're going to see that in a moment. So... This is a fancy, very convoluted, complicated, if you want this later, I'll give this to you. A pastor friend of mine gave this to me, and it's a great, great thing to go. And we're not going to go through all this in, the, you know, in detail, because we're going to be actually talking about this event in this first presentation. 
And then we're going to talk about the healing of the wound as we go into our second presentation, okay? Well, we're going to talk about it in the first presentation as well. But you see papacy wounded, knowledge increased, Daniel unsealed, 1798. There we are. And we're living after that time, right? Yeah. So we're, we're kind of, and we're after 1844, right? So we have to understand where we are in this line of history. That's important for us to understand as we look at history. So we're kind of, we're, we're kind of in here somewhere. Has the Sunday law been enacted yet or enforced? I mean, it, there are Sunday laws out there, right? Yeah. The other day I was at a, um, where was I? Publix. And I was in line buying some flowers for my wife. It was, it was a Sunday. And as I was in line there, uh, somebody was there with a bottle of wine. It was not me, I promise you. And somebody was there with a bottle of wine. And as they got to the cashier's register, the cashier said, um, I can't sell that to you today. I'd never heard that before because I don't buy wine. So I, don't, I did it. And so I asked, you know, after, actually she was in front of me. So she went back to take the wine back. And I asked the cashier, why couldn't she buy the wine? Oh, you didn't know? We're not allowed to sell wine on, on Sundays. Interesting. I was introduced to that a few years ago, a, a similar situation, not similar because I don't buy wine, but I was, in, uh, I was living in Europe. I was living in Austria and G Germany, and I was at my uncle's house, my dad's older brother, Kurt, his house, um, who's a pastor, and I was washing my car on Sunday morning in his driveway of his house. He was still asleep. I don't know. He was doing something else, and, and he comes out, put everything away. Stop washing your car. You can't do that. We're, we could be fined. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I washed my car on Sunday here in Tennessee. Well, I wasn't living in Tennessee at the time, but all the time, right? We wash our cars on the days where we're... He says, you can't do that. Sunday laws, we cannot wash cars on Sunday here. If, if a neighbor reports us, we'll be fined. Okay, this is Germany. Okay? By the way, where there's no separation between church and state. Right? There's official church, state. There, by, by the way, Roman Catholic is official in Germany and Protestant. Lutheranism is official to state churches. All right, so this is where we live. Now, this is where we are. We're not yet at the buying and selling thing. We're, 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 we're here. But I'm going to talk about this date specifically, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened here and what happened here. So, and then we're going to move on beyond that in our second presentation. So what you have to understand is historicism was the method of interpretation that gave rise to the Protestant Reformation. In fact, there would have been no Protestant Reformation without the historicist understanding of prophecy that pinpointed who the man of sin was in Thessalonians, who the little horn was, and who the sea beast of Revelation 13 was. I don't have a copy with me today, but um, a friend of mine had a copy, the original Luther copy of the, of the Bible that was printed by Luther in 1534. It was completed with New Testament in, in earlier on, sorry, 16. Did I say 15? I meant 16, 1634. But in there, there's notes that Luther put into the Bible, like study notes, or, or, and Luther gave interpretations, and he specifically, uh, in Revelation 13, referred to uh, the sea beast of Revelation as the papacy. And he became more and more vocal about his identification of the papacy as the Antichrist as time went on in his experience. So the Jesuit Counter-Reformation came about as a result. Some of you know all this stuff already, but some of you may not. Francisco Ribera was a brilliant Jesuit priest and doctor of theology from Spain. In 1537, he lived to 1591, and he came up with the idea. It, was, it wasn't 1634, it was 1534, you guys keep second-guessing myself here. So right around the time when Luther was alive, Ribera was, Ribera was alive. And Ribera was clearly articulating um, a counter-reformation idea that or originated from the, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, to, to move people away from historicism. Because what did historicism do? It identified the Pope and the papacy as the Antichrist and as this movement. Okay, so let's not have that. In fact, this is the Oxford Handbook of Eschatology. Eschatology is last day events. This just was published. I have a whole series. I'm actually contributing to another Oxford Handbook right now. But the Oxford Handbook of Eschatology was just published in 2007. So this is a fairly recent publication. And in this publication, I want 
Just to read this, Futurism, quote, argues that Revelation looks beyond the first century to the period immediately before the end times. Thus, the book was not written for those who received it, but for those living much later. Jesuit scholars after the Reformation refined this approach to prove that current attempts to identify the Pope as the Antichrist could not possibly be true since the Antichrist will not be revealed until far into the future, just before the parousia or Christ's second coming. So you know dispensationalism, futurism, they're all kind of part of the same uh, uh, thing. And a, a few years ago, I was doing evangelism in St. Louis, Missouri, and we were handing out a Bible there that one of the elders kind of was a little bit frustrated that we were doing. Uh, it was a Bible, a study Bible that he didn't really like because it had certain things that had been changed in it that he didn't like very much or certain interpretations he didn't like. And he says, you know, study Bibles can be dangerous sometimes. I never thought about this this way before. I have several study Bibles. But he said study Bibles can be dangerous because it was the influence of one study Bible that was published in 1908 that changed most Protestant thinking from historicism to futurism. And that was the Schofield Reference Bible. And everybody began, I mean, that was very popular. Everybody began reading it, and it shifted the whole interpretation of Scripture from what it was historically, historicism, to something very different, just at the beginning of the last century, 20th century. So not only the, was futurism born during this counter-reformation period, but there was also another Jesuit scholar from Spain as well in 1614 who came up with the idea of preterism, which is the most common way that Daniel and Revelation are interpreted by most secular scholars, I should say most church scholars today as well. And that basically simply says that rather than putting everything off to the future, everything has already been fulfilled in the past. In other words, the prophets weren't really prophets because these scholars are rejecting the idea of divine inspiration and revelation. They reject the idea that God can communicate directly the future. We, you and I don't know the future, right? So they basically say that's they're, they're philosophical naturalists, so they just don't accept any of, kind of future prophecy. And they say Daniel wasn't foretelling what was taking place in the future. He was simply foretelling what had already taken place in the past. And as some of you know who have taken Daniel, they redate Daniel to the second century, which is still a problem because Rome rises after that, but that's another story. So both of these scholars, these, these ideas did not take off then. Okay, they didn't take off then. Historicism held sway for another century or more. But preterism in particular, with the rise of the Enlightenment, began to take deeper and deeper root in the Protestant churches as well. And we'll come back to this in a moment. The great event, of course, to counter the Reformation was the Council of Trent, which is pictured here. Um, a series of meetings by ecclesiastical authorities from the Catholic Church that met in Trento, Italy, or Trent as we call it in English. And they, they met there year after year to try to mitigate how they were going to deal with the threat of Protestantism, which they viewed as a threat. And a lot of important decisions were made here. Uh, we had the original, uh, I, I hope some of you saw in the last year the Bible exhibit we had downstairs. <laughs> we had some of the original documents from the Protestant reformers. And one of the documents we had was the original canon or decisions that were made at the Council of Trent. First edition sitting there in vellum, quite amazing. So there are four, oh, I didn't talk about idealism. We'll talk about that in a second. There are four basic ways of interpreting prophecy that are dominant in scholarship and in thinking over the years. The first we already described as historicism that sees the prophetic timeline as continuous over time without any major gaps, okay? Without any major gaps. The second one is preterism that sees everything fulfilled before AD 400. Bef, you know, before the, almost before the New Testament era finishes in the early church period. It's already done. Everything is prior to that time. Okay? And then futurism sees everything being done in the future. So the Antichrist is some really mean guy that's going to rise up and Israel is going to 
you know, uh, the, the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. You've heard some of these ideas before. And there's going to be a rapture and all this stuff. I mean, this is, this is, today, this is mainline evangelical thinking, Protestant thinking out there. But it never was before. This is all intrusive, and its origin is not Protestant. Its origin is Catholic. That's the very clear thing that we want you to understand. Historicism was the idea. And then idealism, there's no element. Everything is spiritualized. Everything is... Is, is, and we see this happening more and more today, where we no longer have definitive um, interpretations that look at historical fulfillments in history and, and point specifically to events that took place in history, but now it's simply an idea. And I'll go over a couple of these with you. Okay, so this is, this is what we have. Now, I want you to notice something. In all of these three isms that came after historicism, papal Rome is taken out of the picture completely, completely, because it rose, it rose, right? It rose after this, and it was done before this. Of course, papal Rome is still around, but the 1260-year prophecy, the 42 weeks we just talked about, or months, um, the 42 months, the, the 1260 days, that's, that's, that's gone. So it's eradicated by these ideas. It's only historicism that gives us this identity and identifying mark. And of course, there's nothing more that Catholicism wants to get rid of than the finger pointing at them. And by the way, there's wonderful Catholics. I've heard this before. I mean, my, my grandparents were Catholic, made wonderful Adventists after they got converted. Um, there's wonderful people out there. I have Catholic friends. Um, we're talking about systems here and systems of understanding that have been around for a very, very long time. So let's look at this. Historicist prophetic dates. Now, I just got this off the internet. I don't even know if this is completely accurate. One thing that's absolutely not accurate, you never put AD after a number. AD always goes before the number. BC goes after the number AD before. Just a detail, OK? So whoever did this didn't understand that. But we're going to focus. Now, this is what? This is the 1260 days, the 42 months, the three and a half times, right? All of those prophecies, I mean, all of those uh, indicators are part of that 1260 a prophecy that goes from 538 to 1798. Um, and yes, so we're going to look at this time span here, and then we're going to look at this time span here. We're not going to look at the earlier stuff right now. Now, in Revelation 13, verse 3, we have a very important text that we read a few minutes ago. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Okay? So I want to look today at the question, a number of you have studied this, but I want to look at some perspectives maybe that you haven't studied, some evidences that we have that maybe you haven't seen before from the world of art. Because artists, my wife is an art historian here on this campus, so I stole some of this stuff from her. <laughs> I'm giving her credit, okay? My wife uh, teaches art history here, and I had a nice conversation with her today. And we've presented, actually, this together at GYC National a few years ago, some of these points. But, but very quickly here, um, Napoleon, as you probably know, was a very influential individual in France. And he was alive during the French Revolution, the, 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 French, uh, yeah, the French Revolution, which was a horrible, horrible time in history that was also prophesied. Um, and during that time, a mortal wound was inflicted upon the papacy. The pope, here he is at that time, Pius VII, I think it was, was on the throne. And this was the general under Napoleon that in during that time went down to Rome and captured Rome and captured the Pope and took him back to France. The Pope did not want to go to France. France is a wonderful place to visit, by the way, but the Pope did not want to go. And he was taken and forced to go. This is the guy that we're talking about that did that. The Pope ended up dying. Here's a painting of his deathbed. He ended up dying in exile in France. He never returned to Rome. And Rome lost its papal states at that time. The, the states, the, 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 the papal states and the property that it claimed to own 
also through forgery, <laughs> by the way. I don't know if you've ever heard of the donation of Constantine. But uh, Constantine the Great, of course, was the person that first uh, inaugurated the Sunday Law, right? Way back when. And Constantine was the Roman Empire, the first Christian Roman Empire um, emperor. And, and Constantine supposedly had written a donation uh, a set of um, <sighs> documents giving rights of all of this property over to the church. But it's been shown now to be a forgery. We had an original of the donation of Constantine downstairs as well a few months ago. I wish you could have seen it. I wish I could have it here today. But, uh, but that's been shown to be a forgery. So the papal states were lost in 1798. The pope was taken into exile. There was another pope, of course, that continued, but Rome was reduced in its power drastically. It was a wound that it received. Now notice it wasn't a wound that resulted completely in the death of Rome. We know that, but it was, a, it was a wound that it received, and that's what happened. Now, this is another painting, a very famous painting by Jacques-Louis David, a French painter. This is a huge painting that would cover this entire wall and be much higher if you were in the Louvre in Paris, as I was a couple of years ago, and saw this in person with my wife. Now, what I want to show you here, and this is a little pixelated. I don't know why it's so pixelated, because it's not like that on my screen. This is a big picture. And I got a really high res image of it. But anyway, huh? It looks fine. OK, maybe I'm just too close. So I just want to show you some details here in this. This is the queen. She's about to be crowned queen. Now, who normally crowns kings and queens during this period of history prior to Napoleon? The pope did. But the pope is not doing that right now. In fact, the original painting of this by Jacques-Louis David did not show, this is Napoleon actually here, did not show him about to crown his wife, but actually was placing the tiara above on himself. He was crowning himself king. The, the, well, this is the original, but art historians have seen that a crown has been erased here and covered up by paint. If you do the art historical analysis, actually, and look behind, because there's layers of paint sometimes. The original, the original one had him placing it on himself. But that was too audacious, even for that time. And so they, they, they made it a little bit more politically correct and had him. But even for the king to crown his own queen, that's not done, right? Was that done recently when King Charles was made king in England? No. King Charles didn't put his own crown on. Who put it on for him? The bishop. The archbishop, right? The archbishop did in Westminster Cathedral. And by the way, this is in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. That this is happening. Where's the pope in all this? He's here. Now I want you to notice some. This is the same pope that's in exile in France. That's taken captive. This is the same one. And Berthier, the general, he's right over here. That's Berthier. These are real people all depicted here. This is the pope. This is uh, Napoleon's mother here. Um, even Jacques-Louis David put himself in the painting, okay? He's up here. That's Jacques-Louis David over here, okay? Kind of in the background, kind of this cameo kind of, you know, thing. Uh, directors sometimes do that in movies as well, I'm under, I understand. So anyway, here is, uh, here's the, here is the, and notice he's shown much more kind of, you can see more of his face, more of his body. You can see more of him than these two individuals and this guy over here, right? His costume is seen much more clearly, and he's holding something. Notice he's holding something. Notice he's holding something. And notice this guy behind the pope is holding something. Very, very important. We'll take a close-up look. OK, here is Napoleon. If you were to look very closely at his, at, above his head, it had some special um, uh, infrared kind of uh, tools you could see behind some of the paint there and see that the crown was really there. But what I want to point you to is the pope who's sitting here. The pope originally did not have his hand up like this giving a blessing. Originally, again, art historians have shown that the pope had his hands folded on his lap. But Napoleon later asked the artist to change that because he didn't believe it was appropriate for state church relations to have the pope doing nothing. So at least he could give blessing to the ceremony. Okay? At least he could give blessing to the ceremony. But he wasn't crowning the king. That was a huge thing. Not wearing the triple tiara. The triple tiara is being held by one of his 
servants behind him. You see it here? Very significant stuff here. Very significant stuff. But what's even more interesting is if we take a close-up look at these guys. There's the Pope again. There's the tiara. What is Berthier, General Berthier, holding in his hands? He's holding the globe with the cross on it. The globe is the symbol of the whole earth, and usually it was the Pope that held this in their hands and handed this then to the king to give him dominion over something. But Berthier has taken it away from the Pope and is holding it to give as general eventually to Napoleon. Interesting, huh? So this is all, this is history. This is history and it's documented. This happened, by the way, this, this painting was painted in 1807 or 1808, I believe. The event happened in 1805 after 1798. Are you with me? So this is between 1798 and 1844. Now I want to go back a little bit earlier. Actually, not earlier in history. This is a, this is a painting done by a guy by the name of um, uh, Jean Baptista Noli, an Italian guy. Yes, ma'am. These like yeah, how come yeah. you know, they're on because of they're under the I think. They're on because of my my filming. Can we put these these uh, lights off in the back? Yes. Is that better? All right. That's why we have these lights the way they are. Okay, so here you have here you I want you to so this is this is this is the Benedicto the Fourteenth. Benedict the Fourteenth is the Pope that commissioned this. This is the first scientific map of Rome ever done. I've got to hurry because I've got a lot to cover here. First scientific map of Rome ever done. But what it shows you is the continuity. This is commissioned by the Pope, by the way. Jean-Baptiste Sinoli was a guy that went all around Rome and measured everything carefully with the latest, latest surveying tools. Not lasers and stuff like that, but this was in the 1800s, right? 17, 1800s. This is around the same time that we're talking about. This is the period of the Baroque period. And here you can see ancient Rome depicted, the ruins of ancient Rome. And here you can see the Ecclesia sitting on her throne in what is uh, papal Rome. Okay? Very interesting. Imperial, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Are you with me? Little horn horizontal, little horn vertical. Okay? There we go. All right. Let's look at this closer. So here's a close-up. This is Roma. The goddess Roma, or the depiction of Rome as Roma, she's a female, okay, sitting here. This is the river Tiber looking up to her, because the Tiber River goes through Rome, right? And uh, is what gives Rome life. Notice that his hands, his fingers are broken off, his hands are broken off, his foot is broken off. This is ancient. This is something, these are ruins, okay? These are statues that are ruins, and it, it shows you that it's in the past, okay? Um, you know the story of uh, Remus and Romulus? The origin of Rome is Remus and Romulus. They're, they're two twins that are out in the wild and they get lost and, and a wolf suckles them um, into life. Here's the wolf and here's Remus and Romulus and they suckle from the, the, the wolf's teats and, and so forth. And anyway, there's all kinds of symbolism over here, okay? This is the foundation of Rome. Ancient, pagan, papal, I'm oh, sorry, ancient, pagan, imperial Rome. But look at what it's looking across at. She's looking across at her, sitting upon the throne over here on this side. And here we have the ecclesia, the church, seated. Behind her we have, this is a very important building. This is um, the Lateran. Um, and here we have a little putti drawing up things. And you have these little angels flying around. This is the Baroque period where you see these little angels. Notice what this angel is handing the church. What is this? That globe with the, with, the, with the key on it, actually. And then you have this special cross here. And what is the putti doing above her head? Placing the papal tiara on her. So this, the papal tiara represents spiritual power. And the orb here, the globe, represents temporal power. Power to rule over the earth. So you have to remember that for the popes and for the church, these two elements of church and state were never separated and should never have been separated. They always were together. It has always been the goal of the papacy to rule the world. And they did for a period of time. This is their own work showing us today 
the connection after all these years between pagan and papal Rome as we see in prophecy in Daniel and here in Revelation 13. Now, very quickly, we started late. I can go a little late, right? Yeah. Okay, so the papal states here, look at this. Papal states after the Treaty of Vienna, 1815. Remember, he lost that in 1798, right? So these are the papal states that were taken away from the Pope, okay, and given over to Italy. Um, but that all changed in 1929. During the time of Mussolini, who uh, was the fascist uh, uh, ruler of Italy, that's him seated here. This is a cardinal that is seated there as well. The three architects of the new uh, Italy, and, and this is kind of the beginning, if you will, of the healing of the wound, if you will, because this is when the Lateran Treaty was signed, giving the Pope back certain rights. Not all the papal states were given back, but the Vatican property was given back to the Pope as an official, not, re not only residence, but country, sovereign country was given back to the Pope at this time. So here's Mussolini, here's the king of Italy, and of course the king's on his way out because after World War I, uh, you know, kings in, in Europe were kind of not part of things anymore. And here is the cardinal, uh, Cardinal Gaspari, who was part of that. Here's a picture, by the way, of the Lateran. This is a very important building. It's a church today, but it was one of the ancient basilicas built by Constantine the Great himself. So this shows you the continuity between Constantine and between the church. This is a very important uh, center today. Um, and the Lateran Treaty did several things. The papacy was granted temporal sovereignty over the Vatican City. By temporal, we don't mean time-based, but, but um, uh, uh, political sovereignty. The papacy was guaranteed the free exercise, that should say exercise, sorry, of Roman Catholicism as the sole state religion throughout Italy. And the papacy, in, re in return, accepted Italian sovereignty over the former Pope of States. So Italy now belongs to Italy. It doesn't belong to the Pope anymore. And yet, really, when you look behind the scenes, I'm not so sure. So we go back to our four views of prophecy. And let me say something now about idealism. We're going to kind of end on this, on this note, I think. I don't know where I am in the timeline here. Let me look. Yeah, I'm just going to share a couple of things here as we end because we have to be very careful today because it is a great temptation. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as an official entity, is the only church that still holds to the historicist interpretation of prophecy. I don't know how, how that hits you, but that's huge. That's huge. We talk about being the remnant. We are the remnant. There's no question about it. If you look at what we're going to talk about this more in the second presentation today, but it, it's, it's huge. So, and I'm, now going to, I'm not going to mention any names, but this is, ha this is what's even happening within our own church in reinterpreting Revelation, in commentaries, in writings, and things. And I, I, I love our, my church. I believe in our church, and our church will go through to the end. But we have to understand that we have forces even within the church that we have to be aware of, right? So, so we need to have our eyes tuned and our ears open, and we have to keep ourselves focused on the word. So eclecticism is a real big thing. What is it, somebody who's an eclectic? What does that mean? Takes a little bit from here, takes a little bit from there, takes a little bit from here. So there are scholars even in our church that say, you know what? Yes, we're historicists, but you know, we could interpret this part of Revelation in a preterist way, and maybe this part in a futurist way. And I'm like, what? These are mutually exclusive, different ideas of, of looking at things, okay? You can't put them together like that, but that's what some of them are doing. Ford crisis. How many of you have heard of Desmond Ford before in the 1980s? Okay, huge, huge rift. What did he do? He went to preterism. He basically said, you know what? Daniel was written in the second century. I don't believe in the 2300 days. Don't be I mean, I, I believe in them not as years, but as in literal days. Huge. He was a professor at PUC at the time, Pacific Union College. It was a huge rift in the church. I was only a kid then. My dad was heavily involved with, with the Glacier View conferences that sought to talk with, with, with Ford and try to talk him out of some of these things. But as a result, there were a lot of, lot of issues. But the, that, that, was, that was something that was major then. But what are some of the things that have... The, the, the ripple effect is still with us today. Um, the year-day principle, among some scholars... Yeah, maybe not, okay? 
Um, it was fulfilled in the Greek Hellenistic period by Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. So Ford basically denied that there was a year-day principle, that a day was a day, not a year, basically. Daniel was foretelling a future event. No, he wasn't. He was foretelling something that had already taken place in the past. That's preterism. But at the result of this eclecticism is that five time prophecies, the five time prophecies of Revelation, in some of the recent commentaries, even within our church, are being either downplayed or, or, or are being given multiple interpretations. And when you give multiple interpretations, you no longer have the certainty of a single historicist fulfillment of a particular prophecy. Are you with me? So let's look at this. The 10 days of Smyrna. This is Smyrna. This is in uh, Revelation chapter 2, the 10 day or 1, 2, the 10 days of Smyrna. Uh, all historicist interpreters from the beginning have interpreted that as being from 303 to 313, referencing Diocletian, Emperor Diocletian's huge persecution of Christians during that time, the worst persecution in the history of the, of the Roman uh, Empire against Christians. But now... Yeah, it could be, but it could also be something else, okay? The three and a half days or years, the two witnesses referring to the French Revolution, yeah, could be the Old and New Testaments, the two witnesses, but it could also be spiritualism and something else. It could be Judaism and Christianity. It could be something else. So there's different kinds of ideas out there. Well, it's either one or the other, and Ellen White says it's the Old and New Testaments. She's very clear on this, okay? Very clear. I, I think that I want to side with inspired prophecy, not simply somebody's uh, human opinion. So uh, we'll just not go into a lot of details, but you can see most of the scholars will, will retain this because this is just too central of, to Adventism, right? But some of the others, yeah, not so much. 666. Now this is something that you find the chapter we've been studying in Revelation 14, right? But uh, a recent Sabbath school quarterly some years back said 666 no longer referred to the papacy but was simply an imperfect number and represented rebellion against God. Now let me ask you something. Is that a idealizing or spiritualizing of a particular very specific thing? Absolutely. Edwin, if you want, if you want the truth about this, Edwin de Kock He's a very old man now. He's still alive, but he's in his 90s. But an 835-page book documenting from the historical sources how Vicarious Philidae is, in fact, a reference to the papacy. Very well documented, copiously documented. You can get his book in the ABC, I believe, here across the street. The Lake of Fire. What about the Lake of Fire? Do we like hearing about the Lake of Fire? Uh, well, if you've been... If you've been experiencing bad things in life, um, justice is not always a bad thing, right? You want justice to, 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 be, to be done. When that points to you, obviously, that's, that's something different, but, but, but we want justice to be done. Anyway, somebody said recently, it's not literal, but a metaphor for complete annihilation. Notice spiritualizing again, idealizing something. Um, we talked about the two witnesses. The seven last plagues in Revelation, not literal plagues, but describe spiritual realities. Be careful, because some of the biggest lights in the church are doing this more and more and more. I mean, the literal interpretation of things, out the window, and let's just kind of look at what these things might mean, and wait a minute, this is what has given us our identity. This is what has given us our purpose and our mission. George Knight, uh, he's a longtime historian. He wrote a book a few years ago, The Neutering of Adventism. And he says, you remove the prophetic element to Adventism and you remove the reason for Adventism altogether. So you have to be careful. I don't have that quote with me, but that's it. So what do we see happening today? Yes, there is a new Roman Empire coming on the scene. This is a cover of Time Magazine a few years ago, I think it was in 2015, the global reach of Pope Francis. This is the cover of Time magazine. What is the symbol he's holding up? The sun. Okay? So there's something happening in the world. We'll talk about this in our next, next presenter, presentation. But I believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been placed on this planet for such a time as this. I believe there's no question about it. The historicist interpretation of prophecy, which gives us this insight 
of the three angels' messages that we have been given for such a time as this. And then, of course, you probably have heard of the five S's that makes Seventh-day Adventism unique. Um, yes, there's other people who believe in the second coming, but I would say that's becoming a decreasing number of Protestants in the Protestant world. Did you know that? It's a decreasing number. Why? Because if you give up a belief in creation, how do you relate to a second coming? Creation happened by God speaking his word. It happened instantaneously, right? God spoke and it was. If you don't, if you don't believe that anymore and you believe in theistic evolution, you believe it happened over 600 million years or something like that for humanity to come about, is Jesus really going to come and is everybody really going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye? Many Protestants are working today for a temporal fix to the problems of this world. They want to establish, and this, they have this in common with Catholicism right now. We've got, been hinting at this a little bit. Jeremy Arnall, Pastor Arnall has been hinting at this. But they have, they have a similar idea that, that the kingdom of, of, of God will be established here. And that's why there's such a huge emphasis on the environment and, and so many other things right now. It's, it's going to happen here. It's not about what's going to happen there. It's going to happen here. Now, I believe we need to take care of our environment. God gave us that, that responsibility in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, right? But, uh, but we have something else happening right now for this. So these, the Sabbath tied to creation, the state of the dead, which is, of course, the basis for accepting spiritualism, if you don't understand this properly. And that's, I'm so happy we're studying that this, this quarter. This, I, I, I spoke with the quarter, quarterly... Um, the Adult Bible Study Guide author, uh, just on Monday I was with him at Andrews University and I thanked him for his study that we're studying this quarter because it's very clear and it's very well done. Spirit of Prophecy, Sanctuary with Jesus as the High Priest, the Second Coming, these are all truths that we have for today. So I need to stop because we're out of time. I had more stuff to share about evolution and some of that, but I just in, in conclusion want to say this. In 1844, just when the first angel's message was about, well, it, was, it started already prior to that time, but it was going out. 1844, two very important individuals were writing about evolution. Charles Darwin had finished pretty much the manuscript on the origin of the species. He hadn't published it yet. He was afraid to. But another guy that had been there at that time, well, here's, here's Charles Darwin if you want to see a picture of him. 1844, he published it. It was published posthumously after he, his death in 1859. But another guy, the same year, Robert Chambers, published anonymously in 1844 The Natural History of Creation. And that book was so popular that Abraham Lincoln had a copy in his library. And it made a huge impact. So this was the beginning of that time. Today, the church, the churches, are not only going to come to are not only having in common the state of the dead issue and not only having in common the Sunday issue, the Protestant and Catholic churches we're talking about, but they also have in common one other thing, and that is a disbelief in creation and acceptance of the evolutionary theory. That's becoming and the Adventist Church is the only worldwide movement that has maintained our understanding of a sixth literal day creation. I think that's also not coincidence. All right, I think we have to end. We were 10 minutes late in this question, so sorry about that. All right, very good. We'll go to our next presentation here in a few seconds. So thank you. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we close. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for how you have guided this movement. When I think of our pioneers, they were deep students of your word. They didn't have PhDs. Most of them were uneducated, but they were educated in, at the feet of Jesus and were educated in your word. And Lord, we need that today. And they were given inspiration from on high through the prophetic ministry of Ellen White. We thank you for that. We thank you for those that have gone before us that have uh, established such sound principles of biblical interpretation for us to understand these prophecies today. And we pray that you would bless us as we go into our next presentation. In Jesus' name, amen.